Good evening and welcome. I think we can get our evening started. My name is David Gibson. I'm the director of the Center on Religion and Culture here at Fordham University. Our office is located right around the corner. Please come visit anytime. We're your host for this evening's discussion, New Nukes and New Risks, the Peril of Nuclear Weapons in an Unstable World. Now, this is an auspicious moment uh, for many reasons. For one thing, we're exactly 60 years out from the Cuban Missile Crisis in October 1962, perhaps the closest as far as I know, or we know, the closest the world has come to potential nuclear annihilation. As a child of the 60s, I was born in 1959, I remember very clearly kind of growing up with all the air raid drills and things like that. Next April will mark the 60th anniversary, similarly, of Pope John XXIII's encyclical Pachem and Terris, and the 40th anniversary of the U.S. Bishop's pastoral letter on war and peace, 1983, issued during another period of great nuclear tensions. Uh, those are sobering benchmarks, but perhaps also encouraging in that we found a way out of those very tense moments. I'd also note that this is the first event that we've been able to hold here on campus with an in-person audience in three years due to the pandemic. We've done well on webinars. I appreciate all of you who've joined us on, on webinars. Um, they've been terrific. But Zoom has its limitations as well as its advantages. And I think it's vital to get back to start returning to the habits of in-person meetings, uh, of face-to-face -face meetings of our community. This event's also the fruit of nearly two years of collaboration with the Catholic Peace Building Network based at Notre Dame with our colleague, Jerry Powers. Jerry, where did you go? There he is up there, yes. Um, who's been great, he and his colleagues. He's the longtime coordinator of the initiative, which has about two dozen affiliated institutions. It was a couple of years ago that Fordham wanted to become a member as well, as I think we ought to, certainly. And we at the CRC uh, have been working with Jerry and others, including our much, much lamented colleague, the late Drew Christensen, to collaborate on a number of initiatives. But our main uh, contribution was to be an event like this here at Fordham uh, connected to the um, a review of the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, a review that takes place every five years at the United Nations right across town. But of course, the, inter the pandemic intervened in that as well, and the NPT review was delayed for two years, and hence our event was delayed for two years. In that time, of course, Russia invaded Ukraine, and suddenly the threat of nuclear weapons and nuclear war and this very issue became ex exceedingly urgent and immediate and real. The NPT review finally took place this past August, and now we're able to host this event, and I can't imagine anything more timely than a discussion like this. As Pope Francis said yesterday evening at an event at Rome's Colosseum, quote, we are at a crossroads. We can be the generation that lets the planet and humanity die, that hoards and sells weapons in the illusion of saving only ourselves against others, or we can be the generation that creates new ways of living together, that doesn't invest in arms, abolishes war as an instrument for solving conflicts, and halts the extraordinary exploitation of the planet's resources. He kind of combines that whole issue of climate change and nuclear catastrophe, both existential threats to our planet, our society. Now, to explore how we might be able to make the right choices at this crossroads in human history, we're going to be joined this evening by an impressive lineup of scholars and diplomats. Rose Gottmuller was the Deputy Secretary General of NATO from 2016 to 2019. She also served nearly five years as the U.S. Undersecretary for Arms Control and International Security. Prior to joining the Department of State, she was a senior associate 
with the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, with joint appointments to the Non-Proliferation and Russia programs. She has firsthand experience. Rose is currently a lecturer at the Center for International Security and Cooperation at Stanford University. Ambassador Juan Manuel Gomez Robledo is the Deputy Permanent Representative of Mexico to the United Nations and a member of the UN's International Law Commission. He earned degrees in law and international relations while studying in France and earned his PhD in international law at the Universidad Nacional Autónoma de Mexico, Mexico. He has served in Mexico's diplomatic corps in many postings and has extensive experience in disarmament issues. And finally, Marianne Cusimano Love is an associate professor of international relations at the Catholic University of America in Washington. She is on the core group for the Department of State's working group on religion and foreign policy, and she advises both the, the she advises the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops on foreign policy issues. She has written widely on the ethics of war and peace building for both scholarly and popular audiences. I can't think of anyone who has written so much and with an accessible, such an accessible style. As a career journalist before coming to Fordham, I was always grateful to be able to have someone like Mary Ann to turn to, to explain to a layman like me. Finally, we're also privileged to have with us Archbishop Gabriele Caccia, who was named by Pope Francis to serve as the Holy See's permanent observer to the United Nations in November 2019. He is a priest of the Archdiocese of Milan, a beautiful archdiocese, and was ordained by the late Cardinal Carlo Maria Martini, to my mind a great churchman who I think would be pleased to see the pastoral and peace focus of the church today under Pope Francis. Archbishop Katja has served the Holy See in diplomatic posts from Tanzania to Lebanon to the Philippines and now here in New York City at the United Nations. The Archbishop in a moment will provide some opening remarks to situate our discussion. But first I wanna run down how the evening will go. After Archbishop Katja speaks, we will turn it over to our panelists who will each give a brief synopsis of how they view the situation today. Then I'll ask a few follow-up questions of our panelists and we'll have some discussion among ourselves, but I very much wanna open it up to you all, to our audience. We have very many uh, knowledgeable and experienced people with us this evening. We encourage all of you and any of you to ask, ask questions of the group and each other. Most important, please silence your cell phones. <laughs> all of a sudden, we're not on Zoom anymore and we have to remember to do that, right? So I appreciate that. Many thanks and now please join me in welcoming Archbishop Gabriele Caccia. Thank you for uh, this kind of introduction uh, and for the invitation to speak uh, this evening. Tonight's event is dedicated to Father Drew Christensen in his 60 years as a member of the Society of Jesus and 50 years as a priest, Father Drew made invaluable contribution to the development of Catholic social teaching, especially regarding nuclear weapons. Father Drew's engagement with the Holy See mission to the UN lasted for almost two decades. In that time, he served on delegation to various conferences on nuclear weapons, including the conference which drafted the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, TPNW, in 2017. Later that year, he helped facilitate a Vatican conference during which Pope Francis first condemned the possession of nuclear weapons. Father Drew later edited an award-winning book of papers from the conference with Carol Surgeon entitled A World Free from Nuclear Weapons. It is safe to say that without Father Drew's contribution, 
the Holy See condemnation of nuclear deterrence would not have arrived as soon as it did. Beyond this, Father, Drew, leg, Father Drew's legacy will live on through those he educated, collaborated with, mentored, and inspired. And uh, I think that, like in the gospel is said, you recognize the tree from the fruits. There are many fruits tonight, and so you will appreciate the tree that uh, was at the origin of that. 60 years ago, yesterday, in the midst of the Cuban missile crisis, Pope John XXIII appealed for peace over the radio, imploring governments to, I quote, do everything in their power to preserve peace and spare the world the horrors of war, whose consequences are too appalling to be foreseen. In the days that followed, President John Fitzgerald Kennedy and Soviet Premier Nikita Khrushchev stepped away from that brink. The crisis inspired John XXIII to write his encyclical letter, Pacem in Terris, which outlines integral disarmament. While admitting that the monstrous power of modern weapons does indeed act as a deterrent, he blamed the arms race for causing people to live in the grip of constant fear. In response, Pope John XXIII called for a ban on nuclear weapons and for general disarmament. He warned, however, that unless this process of disarmament be thoroughgoing and complete and reach men's very souls, it is impossible to stop the armed race. The teaching would remain in place for half a century. Pope John Paul II reiterated it when he spoke before the United Nations in June 1982, noting that deterrence as a step on the way toward progressive disarmament may still be judged morally acceptable. It was only three decades later, under Pope Francis, that the Holy See's positions evolved. During the UN's high-level meeting on nuclear disarmament in 2013, the Holy See said that reliance on nuclear deterrence formed the chief obstacle to disarmament and argued that the time for the acceptance of this doctrine is long past. The Holy See expanded upon this in its contribution to the 2014 Vienna Conference on the Humanitarian Impact of Nuclear Weapons, a text that Father Drew helped write. It calls for embracing the abolition of nuclear weapons as an essential foundation of collective security and wars against succumbing to the limits set by political realism in achieving such abolition. The 2014 conference eventually led to the TPNW, the Prohibition Treaty, which the Holy See signed and ratified on the first day that it opened for signatures in 2017. Later that fall, at the Vatican Conference on Disarmament, Pope Francis condemned the very possession of nuclear weapons for the first time, as well as the threat of their use. Two years later, Pope Francis reiterated these condemnations in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, while further elaborating the process of integral disarmament. There, he affirmed that the mentality of fear sustained by nuclear weapons ends up poisoning relations between peoples and obstructing any form of dialogue. In response to this, Pope Francis called for peace based upon a global ethic of solidarity, which requires the involvement of all. With the return of dangerous nuclear re rhetoric in, this, in the context of the war in Ukraine, the world now, more than ever, needs integral disarmament, which calls on every person to disarm his or her own heart and to be a peacemaker everywhere. In this regard, world leaders must relearn the lessons of the Cuban Missile Crisis 
and again recommit to dialogue in recognition of the catastrophic humanitarian and environmental impacts of any use of nuclear weapons. Indeed, it is only through such dialogue that we can hope to eliminate nuclear weapons and guarantee that they are never used again. And I would quote another small passage of the message uh, David was uh, relating before. The Holy Father with religious leader of any Christians, but also of other uh, confessions, other religions met in, in Rome for two days. Even the uh, president of Italy, Mattarella, and president of France, Macron, were there during this. And in the appeal that you can find on the web, there is a passage very uh, important. Humanity must end wars, or it will be war that ends humanity. The world, our common home, is only one and does not belong to us, but to future generations. Therefore, let us rid it of nuclear nightmare. Let us immediately reopen a serious dialogue on nuclear non-proliferation and then dismantling of atomic weapons. Let us start again together from dialogue, which is an effective medicine for the reconciliation of peoples. Let us invest in every path of dialogue. Peace is always possible. War never again, never again one against the other. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you, Archbishop, for those uh, words of uh, yours and of Pope Francis's, and especially those remembering our colleague, Father Drew Christensen. Um, there will be also uh, subsequent, I think, uh, programs in, in honor of Drew down at Georgetown and other places in the coming months. Now I can invite our, um, our panelists to join us up here on the stage. And we'll make sure you all get um, technically hooked up and we're sure that everything is running. <laughs> okay. Um, so each of, uh, each of you is going to give just a few minutes of um, your view on where we stand today, perhaps what some of the most important points are. Why don't we, um, uh, Ms. Gottmuller, why don't we start with you, okay? Thank you so very much, and, and thank you for the honor of being here tonight. It's um, quite a moment. Never did I think I would be taking part in this event when we would have so much threatening language going on with regard to not only nuclear weapons threats, but radiological threats in recent days. And even at the UN uh, yesterday, uh, there were exchanges of all kinds of, um, I would say, false accusations from the Russian Federation, but a lot of pushback and a lot of exchanges of views on the notion that Ukraine is about to use a dirty bomb, a radiological weapon, mm. in this crisis in Ukraine. I. Um, have been very disturbed by nuclear saber rattling from the outset. But it does offer us, I think, a, a real moment to reflect on the value of nuclear disarmament and what we have been able to achieve since the Cuban Missile Crisis 60 years ago this week. I have been asked repeatedly in recent months, after Ukraine, can we still control nuclear weapons? And my answer is we must. We absolutely must. They are an existential threat to mankind. One um, colleague from MIT speaking on the radio yesterday said, if nuclear escalation gets out of control, this will be an extinction event for the human race. This was quite a strong statement, but I thought that really does grab the sense of peril. When you say existential threat, you kind of think, well, what exactly that, does that mean? But when you say it could be an extinction event for the human race, that brings it home. We can get into why I think that is, uh, and my colleagues perhaps would comment as well during the discussion. 
But I really want to also talk about what is possible now based on the experience of the Cuban Missile Crisis. We must control nuclear weapons. What can we do to do so? 1962 launched a remarkable, I would say, 60 years of diplomacy that really produced uh, an enormous uh, amount of nuclear disarmament, starting after uh, just a few, a year after the Cuban Missile Crisis, not even, with the limited test ban treaty that banned nuclear testing in the, in the atmosphere in uh, 1963 in August. Then moving on to the Non-Proliferation Treaty, further testing negotiations, and by 1972, bilateral agreements between the uh, USSR and the United States to begin the process of limiting strategic nuclear forces and missile defenses, the ABM Treaty and the SALT-1 Agreement. So in those 10 years, there was remarkable progress. Of course, there have been fits and starts over the years, but we went from, and I think it was the shock of the Cuban Missile Crisis and, and the threat that, that really it, uh, it foretold that led governments, Moscow and Washington to begin with, but also the global community, governments around the world to join in this effort. Many of these negotiations, like the NPT, of course, being very much international multilateral negotiations. So I do think that we were able to accomplish a lot. I always like to say, during the Cold War, we built up egregious amounts of nuclear weapons. The United States had built over 32,000 nuclear warheads by 1967, the Soviets had built, by some accounts, over 40,000 nuclear warheads during the Cold War. So the disarmament process did lead us on a steady downward trajectory. So we're saying today, by some counts, 15,000 nuclear weapons. That's still a lot of nuclear weapons. I don't argue that that is enough. But I do think that this process after the Cuban Missile Crisis led us on a steady and Really, I think, a serious downward trajectory. I like to say we dealt in many ways with the ash and trash of the Cold War through this disarmament process. But what do we do now in the grips of this new crisis when Russia is behaving irresponsibly, rattling the nuclear saber, talking about dirty bombs in the hands of the Ukrainians? Many of us fear a false flag operation uh, in Ukraine that the Russians would blame on the Ukrainians, but then use it as another reason to escalate the current conflict. So what can we do now? I want to leave you with a few reasons for hope and reasons for optimism. Quietly, quietly, behind the scenes, the United States and Russia have been working to get the implementation of the New START Treaty back on track. The on-site inspection regime under New START was halted during the COVID pandemic. Naturally enough, inspect inspectors could not travel between the two countries. So quietly, quietly behind the scenes, they have been working to get these inspections back on track. They are about to convene the implementation body of New START to work through the final measures. Again, for the first time, you said it's been three years since you've had a, mm -hmm. a meeting in, in person, but it's also been a couple years, two and a half years since they've been able to meet in person for the Bilateral Consultative Commission, the implementation body of New START. That is about to happen. Furthermore, and this is a, a conundrum that I am wrestling with, but the Russians are talking about bringing their new Sarmat heavy ICBM under the New START Treaty. By the definitions of New START, the Sarmat, which is a replacement for their much older SS-18 intercontinental ballistic missile, it should naturally fall under the treaty. And I thought, oh, this is one of those those so-called exotic new systems that Putin rolled out with great fanfare in 2018, maybe they're gonna to refuse to bring it under the treaty. But no, a couple of weeks ago, they announced publicly in their media that they are planning to uh, give a so-called exhibition of the missile early in the new year in February, and then as it enters deployment, it will enter under the limits of the New START Treaty. And that is the important thing Yes, we are modernizing, the United States is modernizing. Yes, the Russians have been modernizing and building new systems. So if we, if we want to move rapidly to nuclear disarmament, then, then that is not the way to go. But I think it's vital to keep these modernization processes under limitations of a treaty. So a follow-on is needed to New START, and I would argue that this quiet technical process that's going on 
in, um, not in <laughs> any single place at the moment, but they will be meeting together soon. They've been meeting virtually, like we all have been, to get this work done, that this quiet technical process should lead to framework discussions for the follow-on to a new start, uh, well, a new start follow-on, a new new start treaty, because that treaty goes out of force in February of 2026. So I wanted to leave you with, with a, a, a thought that progress is possible and progress even now is going on. But we truly need the help of the entire global community, the countries such as Mexico who have been so powerful in the disarmament movement and nonproliferation movement over the years, but also the religious groups, and I really give the Holy See, the Vatican, a good deal of credit for pushing this issue over the last decade. Uh, Father Drew and I used to argue all the time about the TPNW as an <laughs> undersecretary of state. My position has been and continues to be somewhat different on its value. But nevertheless, it is valuable to have that impetus to further disarmament. And I do believe that the NPT community and the TPNW community can work closely together and are working closely together coming out of the NPT review conference on the topic of nuclear risk reduction. So I will leave it at that. I look forward to our discussion and uh, truly hope that uh, we can get to the heart of some of these issues this evening. So thank you very much. Thank you, Rose, very much. We needed. I, mean, I, I love a, a few notes of hope to start out with. That's good. And yes, Jesuits have been known to argue. Um, <laughs> Father Drew especially. He yes, exactly. Uh, Ambassador? Thank you very much. And um, I can say that uh, Rose's optimism is contagious. <laughs> and uh, she's certainly right. Because um, even uh, early this year, in January 3rd, the five nuclear powers issued a statement in preparation for the NPT review conference, which would have taken place in January, but because of Omicron, it was later postponed to August. But in preparation for that major event, the five uh, nuclear powers, as, as I said, issued a statement saying, basically, a nuclear war can never be won. So it should never be fought. Mm -hmm. And at least it shows that each and every of the nuclear war, uh, powers know what the consequences would be if any kind of use would, uh, would uh, be made, either by decision, by accident, by miscalculation, uh, the escalation of rhetoric these days, of course, uh, creates a great deal of anxiety. I agree with you uh, that there were years of remarkable progress, not only on the bilateral side, but also on the multilateral. There were, I cannot cite all of the treaties that were negotiated in Geneva mostly, mainly, on a number of issues that created a regime, a legal regime, to at least limit the um, increase of the arsenals, further research. For instance, major achievement was in 1996, the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty. Um, Rose mentioned the Partial Test ban treaty in, uh, in 63, but then in 96 we agreed to ban all kind of tests. And even if that treaty is not yet in force, the good news is that the verification system that was put in place under the treaty works every single day. It's in place, uh, it's monitored from Vienna, and I can tell you that whenever there's an earthquake in Mexico, and we have frequent earthquakes in Mexico, mm -hmm. the system registers those movements. By the way, we just had one in San Francisco yesterday, and it also picked up on that one, so <laughs> there you go. So we have a, a number of multilateral treaties. Let's think about, not only about nuclear weapons, but just briefly, chemical ones. And a major treaty uh, uh, forbid 
forbade uh, uh, chemical weapons, and there's an organization based in, in the Netherlands that monitors what every single country party to the treaty, and we're now basically all, uh, do, um, and the, the inspectors come and check their, uh, uh, the industries, etc. So these were, this was a golden era, even in the midst of the Cold War. Then something happened in 95. And in 95, the major powers, the Nuclear Five, decided that the NPT, which is a cornerstone of the non-proliferation regime, had to be enforced indefinitely. Uh, the treaty was designed to be enforced only for th 30 years. The great bargain, which is the, 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 uh, the way to explain the NPT is that we, non-nuclear weapon states, agree not to have them, not to acquire them, not to do anything to have them. And in exchange, the P5, the nuclear five, agreed to work in good faith towards this armament. That great bargain had, at least for the non-nuclear weapon state, some kind of leverage. Our leverage was the fact that it would end, and we would have to see what to do for the next. When it was proposed that it had to be postponed uh, uh, I mean, uh, was, uh, should be enforced indefinitely, I can be very honest, we lost that kind of leverage. We could not, uh, a great uh, um, tool of pressure was lost. And it doesn't mean that progress was not made because a year later, as I said, we agreed on the comprehensive uh, nuclear test ban. But in, to a certain extent, um, the promises, the commitments under the NPT remain to be more and more unbalanced. And even if at the bilateral level between the US and the former Soviet Union, agreements were made, we, are, we still have too many, too many nuclear weapons. I mean, only one would be enough. To, uh, to put the whole, um, uh, to put the humanity in, in jeopardy. What can non-nuclear weapon states like Mexico do? What we have done since the very beginning. First of all, immediately after the, the Cuban Missile Crisis, we proposed to the region to convert Latin America and the Caribbean as a non-nuclear as a nuclear weapon free zone. The whole region is free of nuclear weapons, and the P5 have committed to respect that, which is very good. And even for countries such as the Netherlands, or France, or the UK, who have territories within the area of the treaty, they have committed to respect that. That has been a success story, because five more the zones have been created on the model of the first one, which is named after the, the treaty that put it in place, the Tlatelolco Treaty. So there's another one in the Pacific, there's another one in uh, Central Asia, there's another one in Southeast Asia. So, and we would love to have, of course, one in, uh, in the Middle East. It is the one that is missing, basically. And there's one in Africa. As one in Africa. So that is a major contribution from non-nuclear weapon states to convert their geographic areas densely populated into areas where no nuclear weapons are allowed. That's the first contribution. The second has been to push for more on the basis of the humanitarian impact that a nuclear explosion may, may have. At a time in which uh, research continues to advance, at a time in which we are told that limited nuclear war can exist, where 
um, uh, weapons are much more precise um, than the, those that were uh, uh, sent to into Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the fear of having a limited war exists. So we worked along with civil society, along with religious uh, um, uh, movements to put more light on what that humanitarian impact could be. We held three major conferences, one in Norway, the second one in Mexico, the third one in Austria, where at the end, once we have made the case of that humanitarian impact, we took the decision to negotiate the missing treaty. And that missing treaty is a treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons, which is in force, which is getting more and more parties. It has 69 parties now. It was signed and open for, uh, it was adopted and open for signature in 2017. You may say it is naive. How could you prohibit a weapon that is there, that is, that is embedded in the uh, military doctrines of a number of countries? Because it's not only those who have it, it's also those who rely on nuclear weapons, basically the NATO countries, the members of the Atlantic Alliance. And the Atlantic Alliance just got two new members, Finland and Sweden, uh, immediately after the, the, the invasion of, of Ukraine. So, but still, in a community of 193 states, where we are also part of the, uh, of, uh, not only of the, we, we, are, we want to be part of the solution, because we could be simply wiped off the uh, face of the earth. So a number of countries, including European ones, Ireland and Austria, New Zealand, came together with those who had already committed through these nuclear weapon free zones to prohibit the nuclear weapons. It is more than a moral uh, um, imperative. It is now a legal obligation where at, we have been successful in stigmatizing the, not only the existence, the possession, and the eventual use of nuclear weapons. And to a large extent, I think that that explains also, if you allow me, Archbishop, to explain, to, uh, that explains the evolution in the thinking and the position of the Holy See. Because uh, I am still very uh, moved when I remember that we together uh, proposed to the General Assembly a resolution that says plainly that nuclear weapons are intrinsically immoral by nature. And this is taught to us also by international humanitarian law. The international humanitarian law is a body of international law that is very le relevant whenever there is an armed conflict. Because even in the extreme circumstances of an armed conflict, not everything is uh, legal. You cannot do whatever you want in an armed conflict. There are rules for the conduct of hostilities. The main one being the principle of distinction between civilians and combatants. Mm -hmm. And even among combatants, not everything is allowed. And it goes back to, 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 to uh, the Middle Age or even before that. So uh, we have learned, and very important bodies like the International Court of Justice, in an advisory opinion requested by the General Assembly on the legality of nuclear weapons, said, to that the core principles of international humanitarian law were applicable also to the eventuality of the use of nuclear weapons. Because if a nuclear weapon is used, it will be indiscriminate. It will not, it cannot, it will not be able to make a distinction between 
civilians and non-civilians. So, just to um, about to conclude, we adopted the treaty, uh, the, the one that I spoke earlier, the uh, uh, Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, not only to continue putting pressure, but also because we regard it as another contribution to the very goals of the, NP of the NPT. The TPNW, the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, is complementary to the Non-Proliferation Treaty, because that treaty, again, in that great bargain, was supposed to deliver disarmament in exchange for the commitment of those who have committed not to have nuclear weapons. So we see these last development of international law as a contribution to the very goals of the NPT. The NPT has done a great contribution to world peace, no doubt. Even if we have now nine nuclear weapons states, and we started with only five, and those four additional uh, states are out of the treaty, namely India, Pakistan, Israel, and, um, and uh, North Korea. And North Korea. Um, they are out of the treaty, but even in spite of that, the NPT has been essential to maintaining peace and security. And let's not forget about the great example of South Africa. South Africa had the bomb, and South Africa, after it became uh, a democracy, when it abolished apartheid, uh, South Africa gave up its, uh, its uh, nuclear weapons. Mm -hmm. So it, it means that it is possible. <clears throat> it means that, that, that it is possible. And the NPT is widely respected. The problem is that, that the dialogue among its parties is increasingly difficult. Mm -hmm. We failed in 2015 to have an outcome document. We failed again last August. Um, so, and we will meet again in 2026. What kind of world will we have in 2026? This is where my optimism starts to, 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 <laughs> to fail. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ambassador. It's a bit of a roller coaster. Marianne Kuzumana Love, how do you see things? Well, I. I'm very struck by what we've heard so far tonight. The, the good news is that we're seeing real movement. The moral norms and the legal norms surrounding nuclear weapons have changed. And that's the good news. We've heard from Archbishop Katya how the church has changed, the moral position regarding nuclear weapons, that the possession is no, is no longer considered uh, moral. We've heard from the ambassador how the legal position has changed and the, the, the loophole uh, has been uh, closed, that nuclear weapons are no longer legal as of last year. Uh, and we've heard from Rose, the real uh, expansion in nuclear arms control and disarmament, slow, certainly, but very much, uh, uh, very much in existence over these past 60 years. So we have made progress in limiting num the number of nuclear weapons and in, in changing the legal and moral landscape. The problem is we have a gap. The, the, the moral norms have changed, the legal norms have changed, but our policies have been lagging behind. And that's what we see in this slide behind us. Why do we still have 15,000 nuclear weapons? Why are we in this crisis situation today with threats of, uh, of nuclear weapons use being made despite these rapid changes in moral and legal norms? So what can we do to bridge the gap how can we continue this momentum that Rose had mentioned uh, and, and continue to work towards a, a world free of nuclear weapons as Pope Francis has directed us towards? And uh, I think there's a number of things that we can do and that we, uh, that we should do. And it's what I call the Peace Builders Toolkit. There's a variety of tools that are used in conventional wars to build peace. And the, often the dismissive response of some of the cold warriors is, well, that's for conventional war. Mm. Those tools have been used by non-nuclear weapon states. That doesn't really apply to, to, to the field of nuclear weapons. And, and I think that's wrong. 
the, the just peace principles and practices that have been used successfully and that the Catholic Church has really uh, uh, worked very hard to build peace in many parts of the world. Uh, these tools can also be pl applied to nuclear weapons uh, to get to deeper nuclear disarmament, and they can also be applied to de-escalate the conflict in Ukraine right now. So what are these tools that I'm talking about? Well, there's really five principles of just peace. Uh, participation, uh, re restoration, right relationship, reconciliation, and sustainability. And, and what does that mean? These are the ways to move beyond a conflict that's very hot right now. And as we've all said, we're really at a nuclear precipice right now, where accident, miscalculation could find us in uh, a, a, very, a, very, uh, a, a very difficult circumstance. And as we're talking about the, the 60th anniversary of the Cuban Missile Crisis, it's important to note how accidental the fact that we didn't have a nuclear war was. During the Cuban Missile Crisis, there was a Soviet nuclear sub, unbeknownst to the Americans, uh, that ha ha was armed uh, with nuclear-armed torpedoes. They had orders that if the war, if they believed the war uh, had begun, that they were to detonate those subs. And they were hearing the depth charges uh, of, the, uh, of the US Navy uh, to, to, uh, to do the quarantine, the blockade of the Cuban Missile Crisis. And they believed that that meant that we, the war had begun and they ordered, they were be beginning to order the use of the nuclear weapons during the Cuban Missile Crisis. The procedure at the time was that they had to have agreement among the officers on board. And two, uh, 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 two of the officers said, yes, detonate the, the nuclear weapons. There was a third officer on board just by accident. He was not a regular part of the crew. And that third officer was the only thing that stopped the Cuban Missile Crisis from being nu uh, a nuclear war between the US and Soviet Union. So when we mark this moment, I think it's important, it, often we bring it as a very congratulatory pat ourselves on the back, oh, saner heads prevailed. It was also uh, a miracle, uh, a moment of divine mercy mm. that, that stopped, uh, stopped that from being a, a nuclear war. And so we don't want, obviously, <laughs> to be in that same position now despite all the progress that, that was made, to, to, to leave it to accident or chance. So I think that we are seeing the advancement of these five, uh, these five principles right now. What we just heard uh, from Rose was the, the official elite governmental processes underway by the nuclear weapons, by the P5 states, uh, to reduce the number of nuclear arms and, and to, uh, to lead to greater nuclear risk reduction and safety. Very important to have those nuclear armed states continue to work together even during the conflict. And I think that the point that she raises is really important. Even at the times of terrible disagreements, those discussions would continue. So it's really important to remember you don't wait until times are good to do peace building. Peace building is what you do when things are really bad. Uh, and that's what the Pope encourages us. Continue the dialogue. Continue even when things are very difficult. So that is the, the first ring, if you will, of participation. What the ambassador told us is we've seen an expansion of that ring. It's not just for the P5 to determine whether nuclear weapons, uh, what the levels should be, what the policies should be. And we've seen a real robust expansion of the participation by non-nuclear weapon states. But what I'm suggesting is this is too important to leave up to governments. <laughs> and that the governments are not the only ones who get to determine this. And so with the, with the ban treaty, we had a mobilization of civil society. We had a mobilization of religious groups. And it was the first time that we had the victims of nuclear weapons heard in the process. And I'm here to tell you that made a difference. Mm -hmm. I was with Drew Christensen. We were part of those discussions in the ban, uh, for the ban treaty. And the morality made a difference. Those moral pleas and listening to the victims and their stories moved people. Mm -hmm. And that is the move of the future that we've seen across a whole realm of humanitarian arms control, from, uh, uh, from the landmine treaty to the cluster munition treaty to the treaty banning nuclear weapons. We've seen an expansion of including the people who are most impacted by these conflicts and raising those voices. That moves the needle. That moves things forward. 
And so we, when we see uh, the discussion in, um, uh, of how to de-escalate the conflict in Ukraine right now, the widening of participation that's being done. We have a colleague from the uh, Ukrainian Catholic University here, Father Pablo, of expanding the participation, having greater solidarity and voices of the people in Ukraine, connecting those with others. That is absolutely important to de-escalate the conflict and to move forward. The second principle, restoration. We have seen this is in the, in the ban treaty as well, that we have to address the, the needs of victims. We have to clean up uh, the, the environmental impact done by these weapons. We've seen this in Kazakhstan, where there's been progress made to clean up from the nuclear wet, uh, testing sites. We see this in the United States with uh, compensation to radiological victims. Uh, but more, much more needs to be done. Those are still all the Superfund sites in the United States are these testing sites, these nuclear weapons sites, and there's still a lot of cleanup to be done. The same will have to happen in Ukraine of restoration, both uh, of the, of the of human infrastructure as well as the physical infrastructure. We will have to have reconstruction of the country, but not only roads, bridges, apartment buildings, schools that have been damaged or, or destroyed, but reconstruction of the human spirit, restoration of the human spirit, trauma healing, et cetera. And those are what are things that uh, our colleagues are doing so well right now in Ukraine. You don't wait till the war is over to do that work. You do it now. Mm -hmm. And that is what they're doing. Even while the bombs are falling in Ukraine, they are working on these issues. Caritas, CRS are mm -hmm. bringing food. They're bringing emergency relief. They're doing trauma healing during the conflict. This goes to the third point of right relationship. Expanding the participation is a way of showing right relationship, the dignity of all, that this is not just for the P5 and the elites and those go few government leaders to address. This is important. We all need to be involved. And so by expanding participation, you're also addressing that right relationship and showing the human dignity of all. And that means you're much more likely to get a peace that will last, sustainability. If you're excluding people from the process, it's not likely that whatever peace accords you get will last, will be implemented. So it's incredibly important to expand that participation, expand right relationship in order to get a peace that will last, sustainability. The last point of reconciliation is one that I get the most pushback on. People think with reconciliation, this is just about forgiveness. We'll all hold hands and sing kumbaya. There will be perfect harmony. I would love that to happen on planet Earth. That doesn't even happen in my own family sometimes, <laughs> OK? Ooh. There's conflict. It's part of the human condition. That is not what, what reconciliation means. There, it, it can be. That's certainly the goal, the aim. But uh, if you don't get to that heavenly state here on Earth, that doesn't mean it's a failure of, rec uh, of reconciliation. Reconciliation means truth telling. It means public acknowledgment. And those are things that are very, very important. We need them in nuclear weapons. That's what the, these treaties that Rose was talking about are so important. They allow truth telling, public acknowledgment through those verification procedures. That's what's so important about the ban treaty that the ambassador was discussing. This allows new benchmarks, greater participation for eyes on the process, for a truth telling, a public acknowledgment. How many weapons are there? Where are they placed? What are the costs? What are the environmental impacts? Uh, and this is what the work of, of Ukrainian Catholic University and others of our colleagues in Ukraine are doing. They're telling the truth and witnessing to the atrocities that they are experiencing right now. They're gathering that data and bringing it forward as witnesses while the war is happening, while the bombs are falling. So the peace building occurs now, not just later when things get better. And I get very frustrated with folks in the, in the, in the nuclear arms control community who say, the conditions are not right right now <laughs> for nuclear disarmament. I couldn't agree <laughs> more with you. And when the conditions are right, then we'll do it. It's the opposite. Even as a negotiator, you don't get to negotiate with your friends all the time. You know that, Ambassador. <laughs> Exactly. It's the exact opposite. You, you, you engage when times are hard. You do this work when times are hard. And only through that work do you get to the better times. They, the better times don't uh, arrive uh, without any, any activity of our part. So I think religious actors are really key in this because they move across. They bridge between the nuclear weapon states and the non-nuclear weapon states. I think the Catholic Church is really important here because it's not a national church. So we have these networks that can bridge across 
the nuclear weapon states and the non-nuclear weapon states. And it's also important because the moral voice of the church, we believe that peace is possible, peace is practical, peace is our calling. To do peace building, you have to be able to imagine a world that includes your enemies. And oftentimes, policymakers have trouble doing that, have trouble imagining a different type of world. So that religious imagination is absolutely key to be able to keep us moving forward, even if it's slow and, and with hiccups and, and with halts, and even if it's during the dark times we face right now. We need to realize we've come a long way. We can continue to come a long way. And it's absolutely possible to build a more peaceful world with fewer nuclear weapons. So thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, and thank you all. And those were encouraging points. So let me be the cold shower on it all and, and raise some of the concerns. I have, a, but I think others do. One is that, um, uh, Rose Gautamal, you, you mentioned the, the, the colleague who talked about it being a potential extinction event. Joe Biden, a couple of weeks ago, saying it's closer to Armageddon than we've ever, than we've right. been since 62. There's the unthinkable, but also there's the thinkable with this talk of, you know, a false flag, dirty bomb kind of thing, a tactical nuclear weapons, that kind of thing. Is that, that seems almost as horrifying in a, in a, in a, in a different way, that there could be a limited, the idea that there could be a limited um, nuclear war. What, what are the odds of that? Let's start with you, Ms. Glutmuller. You know, these threats uh, of uh, dirty bomb use, the threat of bio use that the Russians have been stirring up as well in Ukraine, uh, and the threat that they might use a single or perhaps a couple of tactical nuclear weapons. These are weapons of terror. These are weapons to terrify the Ukrainians and their partners and their allies and try to get, you know, to force them to the negotiating table. So that's how I look at them. I think, though, that <clears throat> there is a chance of escalation out of those, out of even a single use of a nuclear weapon. And breaking that 77 year taboo since Hiroshima and Nagasaki, nuclear weapons have not been used in wartime. So breaking that taboo is an enormous. Uh, I would say, moral burden, and that is one. It, it amuses me to think about it, but I think Putin now is, people ask me, what deters Putin? Well, through all the years of Soviet power, they gleefully, constantly pointed to the United States as the guilty party in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, Putin himself using quite stark language in that regard. And so now the notion that the moral burden for using nuclear weapons in wartime would shift to the shoulders of Vladimir Putin himself and of the Russian Federation, I think has a deterrent effect at the moment, which is why everybody's speculating. Nobody knows what goes on in Putin's head. But um, I do think it might be one of the reasons that there's this shift now toward dirty bomb and false flag, still a weapon of terror, still designed to try to drive Ukraine and uh, you know, their partners to the negotiating table but not quite the same as using um, a, a uh, low yield or a so-called TAC nuke, non-strategic nuclear warhead is normally what we call them in the mm -hmm. expert community. But, but I, that's how I think about it, a weapon of terror, um, but one that we must be concerned about nevertheless. Well, this also raises another uh, point uh, which you could all address, I guess, in your, your talking with your opening remarks about the Cuban crisis and uh, Marianne Cusimano love about how close we came. Um, there's also a different sense that we're not in 1962. There's no Politburo. There's no kind of armature infrastructure in the Soviet Union, Russia now, that there was. There's not that third officer. You know, there's just Putin. And that, that kind of madman scenario seems, I think, to terrify people as well. Is that, is that different? And is there some way to confront that? Ambassador. Well, uh, I think that um, during the years in which the two superpowers continued to engage in uh, building new, uh, not only 
uh, confidence building measures, but real treaties with real commitment, which were under strict verification, we could hope that the terror would uh, progressively come down. And of course, you mentioned, and thanks God, start is still in force until 26. And I assume that it is on a verified on a daily basis. Even if they are not on Absolutely. site, yeah. on yeah. site, uh, on site inspection is only one piece of the verification. But machine. you're quite are, right. I mean, you know that much better than I. And so it's, it's working. But what about the, the other treaties? The ABM lost. The INF lost. Um, no multilateral negotiations since '96. The Conference on Disarmament has not done anything. The next step would have been a fissile mm -hmm. cutoff, the fissile material cutoff treaty to avoid that uh, more fissile material is produced for nuclear weapons. And that would be a powerful incentive for those who still think that they could uh, perhaps build a bomb if they, if they had no access to fissile material that would have been a great deterrent, but that we don't, we, 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 I cannot imagine that we will see that in the in a pretty soon, because since the beginning of this war, the narrative has evolved. Look at the various statements. It's less and less about what Ukraine supposedly did. It's less. It's more and more a confrontation, a global confrontation with the West, with what they call now the collective West. Uh, that's how we, uh, they are called in, uh, in, in Moscow these days. And where um, everything comes in, into that global confrontation. Human rights values, which we believed were universal, take uh, only 93 as a major moment in which we all agreed on a number of commitments on human rights, including, of course, rights of women. All this is being questioned, put, put into question. Uh, what I see is more and more an erosion of values, even before, even before the architecture falls down, even before treaties are no longer there or are violated, it's an erosion of values. And this is where I think that uh, the role of civil society comes into play, where citizens need to take also their destiny in their hands. And you mentioned one very good example when you mentioned landmines. The Landmines Convention, I mean, the world will not be destroyed by landmines. But, but those um, uh, weapons are terrible for civilians. Terrible, absolutely terrible. And in the official framework, we could not agree on a prohibition. That was in 95. Uh, still, important number of countries believed that they needed them for defensive purposes. Even European countries felt that they could know, they could, had to rely on them. We failed one time. And then civil society came. And civil society put a, a great deal of pressure on governments. And we tried again. And in nine months, we agreed on the Ottawa Convention prohibiting nuclear weapons, um, uh, landmines, landmines. And you know why? because civil society was in the room. They negotiated as if they were states on an equal footing, on an equal footing. That was the first time at the UN where we had civil society in the room in that way, not just in the back making speeches at 10 PM when the room is uh, empty. No, 
being there and negotiating on an equal footing. The second time that that happened was in the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, where also uh, civil society, and particularly uh, NGOs of people with disabilities, came um, there. And for instance, at the UN, we had even to create, to build the ramps. The ramps did not exist. Mm. Uh, the elevators, uh, uh, a wheelchair could not fit into the elevators. I mean, there was a, 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 a new consciousness that was created. And this is where I believe that, again, as it happened in the 80s, the pacifist movements that existed um, at, uh, at the, uh, in a particular moment of the Cold War, they were very powerful. And that unfortunately, has, has gone to a large extent. Because after the end of the Cold War, the attention was shifted to other kind of threats. And people felt that even if nuclear weapons were still there, deterrence works. And in the end, they would never be used. And the attention shifted to other issues like the degradation of the environment, like climate change, like other, I mean, other, other very important issues. And um, I think that uh, the millennials That's were right. not yeah. raised uh, with the fear that we, uh, uh, under which we were raised. I, I do want to open it up to the audience in just a moment. But picking up on that point, I did want to ask you, particularly Professor Love and, and Ms. Gutmuller, you're on campuses. I agree very much so that, you know, it's all been climate change, which is also an existential threat. Do you see young people waking up to the nuclear issue or, you know, and I have to admit, I had the same, you know, I lived through 1989. I'm like, good, that's all over. We're done. We're okay on that front. And it kind of fell off the radar. Do you see an awakening at all? Well, I think we can't lose the opportunity that exists in this current crisis. Yeah. So I think what you've described is, is exactly so, that after the, the, the end of the Cold War, there was kind of a sense of relief that, that these numbers had come down and the hope that those numbers would continue to come down. And the focus went to other issues. But now that we have this moment of crisis, people are becoming much more aware of it. And I'm seeing it in college campuses, for sure. Mm -hmm. And this is uh, you know, part of the effort that Jerry Powers and I and others in the Catholic Peace Building Network have been doing at Fordham and other places mm -hmm. to try to get more engagement with youth, with students on these issues, to try to get uh, this information back into classrooms. A lot of uh, 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 politics departments stop teaching classes. On, on nuclear arms control mm -hmm. and nuclear weapons, mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. the classes were very kind of stuck in time. They didn't really come forward to the developments that are occurring today. And so trying to do a refresh and a reboot and to, to show that the connections between these issues, the mm -hmm. connections between cybersecurity issues and nuclear weapons, the mm -hmm. connections between environmental issues and nuclear weapons, that these are mm -hmm. not you know, pardon the pun, siloed, you yeah. know, but these are, 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 are impacting each other and they're integrated, so we need to be looking in a much more holistic way at these things. Do you see that at all? Mm -hmm. Well, definitely, I see it when I tried to teach a course in 1989 at Georgetown on nuclear uh, doctrine. My, uh, the, the, my boss at that time said, you're never gonna get any students, and he was right. So that was a moment when people said, oh, we can put these on the back burner huh. and forget about them. But nowadays at Stanford, there's a great deal of interest. And uh, if I may, I did want to put one issue out on the table for us to discuss further. And it's much discussed at Stanford because we are out there facing the Pacific. And so the rise of China is a big issue. And it's a big issue in US uh, policy now, uh, the rise of China and their modernization of their nuclear arsenal. Mm -hmm. I don't know exactly where it's headed yet. But it seems likely that they are headed in the direction of changing their nuclear doctrine in order to allow for a much greater buildup than they have ever supported doctrinally with the way they've approached uh, nuclear weapons. So I, th I think we have to be aware of that. It's certainly something mm -hmm. that is gripping the attention of, of my students in, in uh, California, but I think also it's gripping the attention of the US government very, very much. And it's just a factor we're going to have to take into account because it will complicate our further efforts to reduce and eliminate nuclear weapons, particularly in that China doesn't seem 
interested in engaging uh, officially on these issues. There have been some successful track two discussions, more or less, but, uh, but not a whole lot of progress in official settings to try to get the Chinese to engage on these issues. So that's, that's also And it seems, in a, in a sense, you're right about that, and it kind of lurches, you know, Russia is in the, in the, in the crosshairs now and is very much the target, and please God, if that issue de-escalates at some point, we'll be back to talking about Iran, uh, Pakistan, China, Pakistan, uh, India, um, North Korea, you know, it just seems, there seems to be less of a kind of a framework uh, for d taking it all into account. Let's open it up here, uh, please. Jerry, did you want to? Yes. Um, well, Jerry the policy and there's Jerry Powers of, the, of Notre Dame. I guess that question's addressed to me. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, my own personal view, I, I have a very pragmatic view of this, and that is to keep driving progress at the negotiating table to get the numbers down and to continue reducing and eliminating nuclear weapons, which is in question now because of this China factor. And you hear it every day in Washington. Uh, oh, we have now, we have to, we have a, a three-peer uh, three peer problem. We have to deter both Russia and China. And as China builds up, people are asking, uh, I don't agree with this argument, but do we need more, more nuclear weapons? So I fear that the momentum is going to be on the upward track rather than on the downward track. So my view is, honestly, uh, I would not fight over something like a no first use policy because I think it would not have a, a measurable effect on what I'm interested in, which is actually reducing and eliminating nuclear weapons. So that's my point of view on it, but no doubt my, my colleagues <laughs> differ. You know, it's a challenge because um, China's the only one with a, a no first use policy. That's right now. The, right now, that has been their policy. And a lot of the discussion around China in Washington has really been a red herring, you know, because when you look at the Chinese numbers versus the U.S. and Soviet, uh, former Soviet and Russian numbers, there's no comparison, which, is why, with you. which is why China has not been wanting to engage. So, of course, you're right, Rose, that things are changing, et cetera, but uh, oftentimes that's used as a way to uh, get us to look over here. Um, I agree with you, Jerry, that, that a new, no first use uh, stated policy would certainly be, be much more rational, would have a de-escalatory framework, would put us on the moral high ground. Because uh, during the, the, the uh, non-proliferation treaty review conference this summer at the United Nations, you know, my colleagues at the, at the US team were in a very awkward position of, of pointing out Russia's nuclear threats in Ukraine and saying, well, those are irresponsible nuclear threats. And the, the nuclear threats we make in the U.S. are responsible nuclear <laughs> threats, you know. And that's not a great, you know, <laughs> uh, position to have to argue. And I think you would be on, on a much stronger uh, uh, moral, legal, and ethical grounds to have that no first use doctrine. And, but the, the Biden administration pulled back on that before the election, before he was elected to office. He, he mentioned that that was one of his uh, uh, ideas. It was not in the, the nuclear posture review. They backed away from it. And I think they did it for the pragmatic reasons that Rose outlines, that they, they felt they would generate a, an awful lot of, uh, of controversy and possibly you know, uh, undermine the, the momentum on other issues. And so the they had to make that kind of a, a triage uh, you know, uh, a, a, a decision. The allies reacted very strongly and negatively. I thought they, personally, I thought they overreacted. But let's just be clear. The policy is that the fundamental role of nuclear weapons is to deter other nuclear weapons, and the chances of them being used are extremely remote. So it's not as if, uh, Marianne, you made it sound like the US is out there at the UN making nuclear threats every day, and I didn't want right. to leave that point right. because but the, but that's extremely the, remote. Right, the US is not making this es escalatory threats uh, as Putin is, clearly. You know, there is a difference between the two. But the other is that nuclear deterrence relies on threats. 
you know, that is the, the, the part of that. And that's, I think, what the, the, the ban treaty folks are saying, that, that let's, let's mm -hmm. look back below mm -hmm. the cover here and see what is involved in a deterrence policy. It is this threat. Can we uh, open up Father Potlow? Yeah. I have another father in here. Oh, no, no. Yeah, okay, I, I misunderstood. Thank you. Uh, yeah. J I, but identify yourself. You're with the... I'm Pablo Smitsnuk. Uh, I, I work uh, director of the Ecumenical Institute in Lviv at the Catholic University of Ukraine. Uh, and I'm now four years at Princeton uh, as a research fellow. Mm. Uh, thank you very much for the discussion. And uh, uh, so, as I follow um, how the U.S. And, and the West approaches the, the war in Ukraine, I, I have a feeling that there is a consensus that Ukraine should be helped and, and assisted. Uh, and I think there is a, a good argument for that, even when we speak about nuclear non-proliferation, because the ambassador mentioned countries, yes, who had nuclear weapons and don't have them anymore, and Ukraine in 1994 <coughs> uh, gave up its uh, huge nuclear arsenal at home, uh, conditions that it, its sovereignty will be respected. And I think that if Ukraine, having surrendered its weapons, is now left alone, that's a bad precedent for countries that might consider that giving up nuclear weapons. But my question is, how can we keep supporting Ukraine and at the same time de-escalating? Uh, uh, many voices that argue for the escalation, they suggest that well, we need to stop uh, yeah. giving weapons to Ukraine uh, for self-defense. Uh, are, are the two goods, two values mutually, ex do they exclude each other? Good Is question. Yeah. The escalation doesn't necessarily presuppose uh, stop giving weapons to Ukraine and supporting Ukraine. Well, I had a, or brother, I'll oh, please, just very brother, quickly please. comment no. that I, I think the United States and the Russian Federation have a special responsibility as the two biggest nuclear powers to bring the nuclear temperature down. I, I wrote about this in the Financial Times two weeks ago on Sunday. And I, my view is that there are ways for Moscow and Washington to quietly negotiate to try to bring the nuclear temperature down while not in any way uh, implying uh, de-escalation or any diminu diminution in the assistance provided to Ukraine. And so that's my opinion. It's a complex argument, but I really do believe strongly that we as the two greatest nuclear powers have a special responsibility here, and we should be trying to engage uh, with Putin to try uh, and get him to uh, depart from this uh, threatening language and, and stop rattling the nuclear saber. How we go about that, if we could be successful, I don't know. But it does not, in my mind, relate to, again, any diminution of assistance to Ukraine. I would say that um, it's not for uh, um, anyone than Ukraine uh, to, uh, and, and to Russia to sit together and negotiate, first of all, a ceasefire, and then a lasting peace. Uh, none of us can impose any kind of condition. I think that our role is just to continue pushing for uh, the beginning of that dialogue to take place. And this is why we have supported the efforts of the Secretary General. And they are not only bad news. The grain uh, agreement, the grains agreement, is a success. Is a success where players such as Turkey and uh, the Secretary General played an important role. And what seemed to be a major uh, problem uh, at the beginning of the winter in places like Africa has largely been avoided. And the exports are a continuing uh, of both uh, grains and uh, also fertilizers. So even in the midst of uh, the invasion, that could be done. Another example is what happened in the Saporizia uh, nuclear plant, where, of course, the danger of an accident 
an accident was very high. But then again, the International Atomic Energy Agency came, offered its services, its mediation, and now you have in the plant, uh, as far as I know, still a team from the uh, uh, International Atomic Energy Agency, um, making sure that uh, the plant is operated in a safe way. Um, and the plant is in occupied territory. And uh, the uh, still uh, techn uh, Ukrainian technicians are, are there. There are also um, Russian military. But even in that very complex context, the mediation, uh, the diplomatic role, the personal diplomatic role of the DG of the agency, uh, Rafael Grossi, uh, was absolutely uh, essential. Uh, but that brings me to the issue of the dangers associated with the safety of nuclear uh, sites. I mean, everywhere in the world. And we can do certainly more for securing those sites. And I remember President Obama with uh, his initiative on um, nuclear security, mm -hmm. which allowed for a number of things to happen, even in my own country. We, uh, uh, one of our reactors, a research reactor, benefited from the cooperation that came from that mm -hmm. uh, initiative. And uh, so there's still a lot of room for improvement. But if the big ones, those who have that special responsibility, and I thank you for, for mentioning it, do not talk to each other, that's, that's where uh, we can start losing any, any uh, reasonable hope. If the, that communication, even discreet, as you said, does not take place, where are we going? Yep, exactly. Can I uh, just interject one quick thing which you raised here, which is, again, the Ukraine uh, nuclear plants. Does this bring, I mean, that's as scary as a nuclear, it's essentially a, a dirty bomb if one of those has an accident, yes, yes, yes. is that, is, is, is the Ukraine theater and what's happening there with these plants, is that bringing a new element to the whole nuclear, I mean, disarmament's talking about arms, right. right? And do we also need to talk about denuclearization, which is a problem with climate change? Well, we, we certainly need to talk about greater safety of these sites. And I think they're safety for a variety of reasons. You know, you have the older generation of nuclear power plants, you know, that we saw even in developed democracy of Japan, mm -hmm. you know, having this trouble with the Fukushima site. Fukushima, yeah. And, you know, now we have the unprecedented situation of the largest nuclear power plant in Europe in the middle of a war zone and being actively fought over. If I can just use the, the, the words of Archbishop Shevchuk uh, from Kyiv said, Ukraine already experienced Chernobyl. Now it stands on the threshold of a new atomic threat that can be 10 times worse. So as we look around the world, and many countries are turning to, to new nuclear power plants, there are new technologies that could be used that could be much safer. But we have to really think hard as we move towards greener energy sources to make sure that the types of vulnerabilities that were built into the old generation of nuclear mm -hmm. power plants are not built into the new generation of nuclear power plants. There are some you know, interesting new technologies that might be much safer, but we absolutely have to do it differently. And then secondly, the point that the ambassador raised, we had a series of nuclear security summits that were very effective in reducing nuclear risks at, at, at nuclear power plants, particularly around these issues of, you know, what are the unintended consequences, the unintended effects that there could be of whether terrorists would get access, yeah. et cetera. Non-state actors. And those have not yeah. been held for several years. Yeah. You know, so restarting those types of efforts, which would widen participation, bring more civil society on board, you know, get greater attention to these issues, I think is really, really important. Stella, Ro Stella Rose, thank you. Good question. I'll just repeat it for the, yeah. Uh, how, do the P5, the, the five nuclear states and four others, view their possession of war, uh, as amoral or immoral? Or 
I'll right. jump first. You're the, mor you're the moral yeah, uh, ethicist. Uh, <laughs> clearly, the argument that the nuclear armed states make is that they have these weapons in order to prevent their use, as we heard from Rose, that the deterrent purpose is, is the reason they have them. But we see in this conflict a nuclear armed state using them in a way that's very Im immoral, not amoral, using them to threaten a non-nuclear state in violation of the Budapest Memorandum, which made security assurances to Ukraine and others at the time when they gave up those, those weapons. So I think it is a, it's an incredibly important point that you raise. If the argument is going to be made that, oh, these are just for deterrent purposes to serve a greater common good and, and, and de-escalate conflict, you know, we have to address these, these circumstances right now where they're using, being used in a quite immoral way to threaten a non-nuclear weapon state. Thank you. And I believe that that question that you raised uh, explains also to a large extent why the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons is so disturbing in certain circles, at least, expert circles, military experts in, uh, in the P5 countries. Because they certainly do not want uh, to be stigmatized. And the, the stigmatization matters. Even when countries violate international law, they continue to express themselves in legal terms, which means to me that they want not only to justify their actions through legal arguments, but in a way, it, it, it means that um, the, 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 uh, the, legal, the legal dialogue matters even for countries that are ready to, to violate the most sacred commitments. So what we, I think we did through that treaty is to start establishing a rule that could, uh, according to the rules of creation of international law, convert itself a number of years in a rule of customary international law. And if that happens, it will be uh, it will bind everyone, even those that have not expressly accepted it. It's what we call in international law obligations are governments. And that's what the International Court of Justice said in that famous advisory opinion. Core principles of international humanitarian law are obligations are governments, even if X and Y countries did not ratify the Geneva Conventions, for instance. So this is uh, very powerful. This is very powerful. And I personally think that the mere possession is immoral. But, and one more. Two, two data yeah. points to back up what the ambassador said. There are treaties that the US has never uh, ratified that we still abide by. So the US uh, still abides by the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty, even though the Senate hasn't ratified it, to, to our, to our uh, great distinction, I think. I'm glad, very glad we do that. And the Landmine Treaty as well, except for the demilitarized zone in, in, uh, between North and South Korea, the United States has largely in, you know, uh, been in, in, in abidance with that treaty, even though we're not, we've not ratified it. So it, it is a very powerful thing. Just a very quick and, and personal comment. And it's something to think about. Um, I am a committed Catholic. I have been so all my life. I happen to believe uh, that the best way to proceed uh, under the aegis of the Non-Proliferation Treaty is to continue to, as I said, do everything we can to reduce and eliminate nuclear weapons in fulfillment of our Article 6 commitments. I worry that for the states that are nuclear weapon states, United States of America is one, if nuclear weapons are limited in legal terms, but also are considered um, immoral, a basis for sin, so to say. What kind of burden does that place on the hands of our nuclear weapons operators? What kind of burden does it put on me as a nuclear negotiator? Am I doing the wrong thing by pursuing the path that I am pursuing, rather than um, declaring and embracing the notion of their, their immortality. So, uh, immortality, we hope they're not immortal. <laughs> Immorality. <laughs> so it's, it's something to reflect on, the kinds of, uh, I understand the debate. I've, you know, 
been debating it with my, my friends across, across the community. Uh, but it's, it does place uh, a particular burden on those who pursue the, the I would say, the long running path of nuclear arms reduction and, and control. You just hope that that one officer on that Russian nuclear submarine is, has that moral compunction, that moral sensibility. Uh, I, yeah, that, I don't yeah. argue with the fact that we've been lucky so far, and, and Marianne yeah. pointed it out yeah. really well. Uh, question up here. Where, where are you from? I'm from France. France, yeah. beautiful. Uh, so I'm aware that uh, the legal and uh, like moral changes uh, you were talking about are some changes. Let me just repeat that real quickly. Jen from France, yeah. her exchange student here at Fordham. Is the, the moral aspect is in a way the first step towards ridding us of nuclear weapons, but you talked about the private sector yeah. as well and their involvement and how we address that? It's really problematic. So in the United States, part of the you know, deal that was done, and Rose knows this better than anyone, in order to get the New START treaty passed was to have modernization uh, be part of that deal. And that is partly because of the pressure that defense contractors are able to put, uh, they, they're a very disproportionate amount of pressure. The money is spent, uh, US defense uh, military spending is spent in every congressional district, so that it makes it very hard for any member of Congress to ever vote to decrease that, that spending. Uh, so that's the challenge, you know, that there are people who benefit from larger numbers of nuclear weapons rather than what Rose has worked her whole life to have decreasing numbers of nuclear weapons. Um, the, the positive side is that we now have tools of transparency and accountability that didn't exist before. And so the advocates in favor of the treaty to ban nuclear weapons, the treaty to prohibit nuclear weapons, didn't just dissipate after the treaty went into force. They continue to, to work toward implementation, to getting more signatories. And part of one of their campaigns is to uh, don't bank on the bomb. And they uh, have a, a whole a series of information to show which banks, which companies uh, make nuclear weapons, how you can d uh, divest from those, how institutions can divest from those, the same way there's a discussion about divestment from fossil fuels. So mm -hmm. there's tools available, I think, to try to take that money side out in a way that would be helpful to allow uh, uh, governments to be able to ratchet down when they're not getting that pressure uh, around the financial incentives. Mm. Thank you. And thank you all. I think we're going to have to end it here. This has been a, a very rich discussion, which could go on for a long time. And a, and a great, it was also, I was just, I don't know, I was coming in without much hope. You, this is a very honest conversation. And there were also genuine and I think honest reasons for hope that you gave us through talking. And I also hope that these kinds of discussions can energize people, especially young people, to realize it's not hopeless. Get out there, the, the, again, the, being in the room, civil society, young people in the room, everyone uh, having a voice can, can genuinely have an impact. And that's, for me, the great takeaway from all of this. And I can't thank you enough. I can't thank our audience enough for, for coming out to our first in-person event in three years. Our next one is going to be up at Rose Hill Campus, actually, on November 10th. Much different topic on synodality, a word very few people understand, but is going to be in your Catholic vocabulary for a long time, thanks to Pope Francis. That's going to be up at uh, the Bronx campus November 10th. I hope you can uh, all join us. In the meantime, please join me in thanking our panelists and Archbishop Katcho.